Hi, everyone. I'm Joelle Lumen, co-chair of the PGA Matron Committee. And on behalf of the PGA, welcome and thank you for joining our panel today with musicians turned producers, Kenneth Babyface Edmonds, Chris Ludacris Bridges, and Ricky Minor. The purpose of this event is to educate and empower young entertainment professionals, including up and coming producers of color, by sharing the experiences of these three highly successful black musicians who've crossed over from the front of the stage to behind the lens. The session will begin with a Q&A moderated by Gil Robertson, president of AFCA, and Janine Rubenstein, music editor of People Magazine. And in the last 15 minutes, we'll I'll be taking questions from the audience. If you have a question, you could type it in in the Q&A section. Um, so type, there's a Q&A button at the bottom. You can type your questions in there and we'll get to it as we can. Thank you and enjoy the panel. Guys, how you doing? Good, man. Good. Hi, I'm Gil Robertson, obviously, uh, from uh, the African American Film Critics Association. And uh, my uh, co-moderator today is the very lovely and talented Janine Rubenstein from People. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Good. Good. So we're going to get started today uh, with questions that basically delve into your identities as musicians who have successfully transitioned into TV and film. Janine, as the, uh, the fairest one of, our, of all of us, I am going to uh, give you the, uh, let's, you have the first question. Thanks. This is, this is quarantine. All me. This time. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, guys, uh, thank you so much for, for even being here and speaking out in this moment. It's such uh, a pivotal moment um, in entertainment in this country. And uh, just your presence here and, and speaking to your experience is, I know, so valuable for me, but also everyone who's tuning in. So I just want to say that I really appreciate you. Um, first thing first, this is uh, a moment where we're talking about things that are pivotal and making it into TV, producing was well, a pivot in your own career. When exactly could you mark that moment, this question is for each of you, um, that it took place? If you said, okay, I've, I've done my thing in music, I have really made it and, and captured, uh, you know, the heart of America with this one particular talent of mine, I'm going to take it to the small screen or big screen and what gave you the, the, the courage and the impetus to do that? Let's go with Babyface. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I knew that was going to come to me first. Um, I, I think it's one of those things where it kind of happens naturally. Uh, you, I remember for, for some reason, the first time I remember having anything <laughs> to do with TV and music was doing the Martin Lawrence wedding right, when he got <laughs> married. Uh, and uh, I sung You Are So Beautiful on it. And uh, so it's part of the wedding and it was actually in the show. And it felt, um, it just felt kind of natural to be able to, to, to do music for that, that's for that scene and for everything. And just, so I got an interest actually at that point, way back then. And um, otherwise it kind of happened through doing uh, movie soundtracks. And you started doing, um, when we started doing all these soundtracks, soundtracks became such a big part of movies. And uh, so when we started with our uh, first soundtrack that we did, which was Boomerang with the, with the face on me and I did that. And uh, the first person that got us interested in it, we, we couldn't believe the success of it. And it was Cassandra Mills who worked over uh, at, I think it was Giant at the time and, mm -hmm. and, and New Jack, uh, city happened and how big that was and she had that color me bad record that just blew up and we were like well how do you do that how how we get in on that and um she kind of explained to us gave us the um the basic strokes of, of what we had to do and had to find a find a right film find a producer find a director find people that would be interested in in the music that we might deliver and we I uh, met with uh, Reggie Hutland and uh, Reggie gave us that shot. Uh, and then 
and Murphy also had to have the final say so as well, who would do it. And then he, he gave us that shot as well. So that was the first time that we actually sat down and looked at looked at the scenes and started trying to imagine what kind of music would be there. And since almost kind of like the scoring a little bit, but not exactly, but just kind of just putting, writing what you saw on that screen and writing what, what you felt in your heart. And, um, and that was kind of like the beginning of, of matching music to, to acting and to scenes that you feel. And it became a thing that was, it, it was fun, but it was hard work at the same time. Um, it's a lot more difficult doing that because when you're just making your record, you're the only cook in the kitchen. And when you start doing something for, for movies, besides the director, besides the producer, you know, there's so many other people that have opinions that you got to deal with. And so it takes, um, it takes not only just, um, you have to work hard, but you also have to kind of take your ego out of the picture a little bit because you're going to get beat up. You might be excited about something, but you know, you got to work, you got to work with people. And, and if you do that, if you do it right, then it can be, it can be a great experience. Um, but so my, my experiences started, started way back there. And as each time as things came up for, whether it was uh, XL to, uh, for doing XL to Soulful to, um, uh, to Boomerang, to doing the music for Josie and the Pussycats, to um, just a variety of things. As a musician, uh, you kind of want to be able to do everything. You don't want to have to be pinholed in one particular genre if if possible and uh that's where you know th that's that's where it helps you and, and it depends on um and that's where you also you uh not to that's where also you look to people like as well like ricky minor who like this guy who as a musician he can do anything and everything and and he can write it and he can talk to the uh, uh to people that are uh, the orchestra, he could uh, talk to musicians in a different way than a kid that's just off the street, just kind of just playing. And that's where, um, so it's, it's a thing where you, where you not only do it yourself, but you also work with other musicians as well to help, help bring that, make that happen. I don't know if I'm going everywhere, but it sounds like I'm going everywhere, but, um, but that's, that's the gist of it to begin with. No, it's great. I mean, you provided a good segue to Ricky, uh, you know, someone who has been behind pretty much every single award show, every, every variety show, and, and just spread his talents across the TV landscape. Ricky, what was your moment going from, you know, just managing music, producing music for individual artists to bringing that to the TV screen? Yeah, well, for me, it, you know, it started with uh, with uh, with Whitney Houston and having someone who believes in you is really where it counts. I mean, you need to have someone to help champion you and really push you a little forward because I think fear and self-doubt can paralyze you and you don't feel like you have a place or is it going to be good enough, you know? And I think that her encouragement to not only take the lead uh, uh, when when uh, John Simmons, who was her music director who hired me, passed away, and she gave me the opportunity to be music director for her. And I think that that, that gave me uh, confidence and kind of pushed me. And my first credit was on one of her specials uh, as associate producer. Uh, I said, well, look, you, you had the idea of the concept of the show. You've got the orchestra, you've got the arrangement. I mean, you should get a producer credit. And I, and of course I protest. I said, no way. I don't want no. Just kidding. I was like, oh great. Now does a check come with that? Because I'm curious, you know. Because <laughs> a lot of times, you know, people feel like, look, you got a credit. I mean, you should be happy. You're a producer now, you know. But you don't understand the business. So I would say, you know, uh, as you're building, make sure you surround yourself with a team that can protect you from the things that you don't know. There's no harm in, in not knowing. The, the harm is not asking for help when you need it. So I don't mind, I'll pick up the phone and call anyone for help. And if I, if I don't understand something, ask. And so that was my first one. And after that, I started uh, producing 
the first TV show after that was uh, as a co-producer of the uh, NAACP Image Awards. And I did that for about 10 years along the way, building other credits. And, uh, and that's kind of how it all started. Uh, but I do like the creative process and, and to echo uh, what Kenny said, I mean, it's really, you got to work with a lot of people. And it's not just the music community that you're working with. And some people uh, have an opinion about how it feels. And every, every opinion as you're working as a team, everyone is valuable and they have a different insight. So you just got to keep yourself open. So you understood the importance, each of you understood the importance of diversification early on and the yeah. value that it would bring to your careers long term. Yeah. Ludacris, talk about your journey, making that transition. Uh, yeah, man, for me, I kind of lucked up. I was um, I was actually on tour with Eminem at the time and I got a call that John Singleton, may he rest in power, wanted me to try out for a role in Too Fast, Too Furious movie. And, you know, I had thought about, obviously, you know, trying to, to trying to dive into movies and characters before, but not that early on, because I think I had only been um, commercially successful for three years. So it was like my second or third album. And like I said, I was just all just completely in the music realm. And of course, once he made that call, uh, I put myself on tape. I was actually backstage at one of the concerts about to go on stage in 20 minutes. And I, I, I remember they saying they needed to be a rush. So I kind of went over the lines and I did my best, you know, in that fast amount of time. And I got the call the next day that I got the role. Luckily, my first role as Tej in uh, Too Fast, Too Furious with my big afro and everything wasn't too far of a stretch from the actual personality that I am as Chris Bridges. <laughs> so I always look at it like that. It was more just about learning, you know, just the fundamentals of being able to recite lines and to a degree dive into a character when everyone is looking you dead in your face and the director is giving you, you know, direction, of course. And that's pretty much how I got my start, man, doing that. And then I started hearing some positive feedback. And then from there came Crash and Hustle and Flow. And those were some really defining moments for me as it's very difficult to be considered and respected as an actual actor when you come from the music world because a lot of people see that you're getting the opportunity just because you're popular and because you have your own fan base. But once I was able to do Crash and Hustle and Flow and these things that got all these Oscar, not only wins, but nominations, then a lot of people in the respected acting world started looking at me as one of uh, their own. And that's pretty much where I got my start. <laughs> You know, in, any, in many ways, the three of you are trailblazers. I mean, Ricky, other than Harold Wheeler, I don't know any other person in the industry that has had the same type of success and access and, you know, on, the, on those big stages. Uh, talk about that and talk about, you know, being the only one, particularly now, you know, as we are dealing with the circumstances that we're living in. Yeah, I think that... Uh... Sometimes it's daunting when you're in a, a big room and, and it's, you know, two or three uh, African Americans on it and everyone else uh, is not and you're trying to convey a, something sensitive uh, in terms of the, the, of, of the um, how you're going to portray uh, this, this particular song and how relevant it is and, and what, what, what culturally is important. And, uh, and sometimes it, it's, it's uh, you know, you go, you go home at the end of the night with a heavy heart, you know, because you, you, you're trying to push this up the hill, this, this really important, say you're doing a tribute to someone like a Cicely Tyson, and it has to be impactful. Or in this case, like um, um, Denzel Washington, you know, and, and, and I've done both those. And, you know, the ideas have to be sensitive to the people. And so it is uh, challenging, but I think that, that uh, for me, it only fuels a fire that, 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 I, that I must. And if I'm given this opportunity, then I have to make it count, not only be at the highest level, but be my best authentic self every moment of every day. And so if I can go in that room and convey with, with still with passion, uh, but not and not with anger, but with passion about why this is important. And I think that anyone, you know, with a heartbeat will understand that. Yeah, I, I, 
actually want to extend that question to Kenny and Chris, like being the only one in the room, the only one at the table, uh, do you find that, I mean, I know it happens in music as well, but you know, when you made that leap into TV and film, uh, was that a bit of a culture shock for you at all? Or were you used to being, you know, that guy? Um, man, I, I would just say that, of course, it was a culture shock for me because to 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 continue on from the, what I previously said about me getting on that set for the first time, I had to learn a lot. Basically, there's a stereotype that comes with rappers, and I would always wonder why I would show up on set and be in my trailer for three hours waiting to go on set. And I think everyone assumed that I would be there with a, a big entourage. It'd be a lot of smoke coming out of my trailer. And I'm one of those individuals that's always on time, always respectful. So it was a hell of a shock for me to get adjusted, but it was more of a shock for people to get adjusted to me, making sure I was professional and not being a rapper showing up to a movie set. I was wanting to be very professional and respectful of everyone's time. <laughs> so that's how I feel about it. Um, I, I think that... It's interesting, uh, Ricky said something like initially he was questioning whether, you know, um, am, I, am I good enough for this job? And can I handle it? And, and I think that's what a lot of us would do because there's so few of us there. You know, you think of it, you see, you see Quincy or you see Harold there and you think like, well, this isn't for us. And so when it was, um, like when Forrest Whitaker came to me, with Exhale and said, yeah, I can write a couple songs. And then he said, but I want you to score. I said, oh, I don't know about that. Um, that's a little much. And I had to keep reminding myself I was worthy that, you know, that I could watch that. And I, and, and all I had to use was my heart to find my way, you know, to, to make it happen. And that's the thing where Ricky was talking about the passion. The passion is everything. It's, it's in, it's, in everything that you do. And then when you have that, it's, it's in with, with Chris, with, when, he, when he's acting, the reason why he was able to do it because it was, it was in him. And, and we just have to kind of like believe in ourselves that, uh, that we can own that. And, uh, and that's the biggest thing is just knowing that you, you can do it. And we get pushed back so many times of thinking that this isn't for us, that this isn't um, something that we do. Uh, and that that same thinking goes in, in terms of genre, whether, you know, well, maybe it should just be something black. Or maybe it should just be, you know, um, you can only do this particular kind of music. And, and, and that's why I would I would push myself to do other things because I didn't want to get in that that trick pony where you are only looked at as a particular kind of genre. And yeah. Uh, yeah, and I was, I'm sorry, I was going to say to piggyback off what Babyface is saying earlier, it is a culture shock for us because I think he said it very clearly in that as artists, we have kind of a blank canvas and we can create something from absolutely nothing. But when you go into the world where you have a writer, a director, a producer, and you're kind of playing one part of that, that's probably the biggest culture shock of all the difference between the two. We're just so used to being free and being able to do whatever we want to do and create nothing from something. And then you go in and you have to play a small part in a bigger role of a lot of different things. So it's a new set of beats and rhythms that you, I'm sorry, Kenny, you were going to add. No, go ahead. It's a new set of beats and rhythms that you have to get adjusted to as you find yourself in this TV film environment. Let's talk about balance. How do you balance those two worlds? Because, of course, you're still an active artist, musician, but at the same time, you're also doing the TV and film thing. And I... I know there might be conflicts with touring, recording deadlines, et cetera, et cetera. So how have you been able to find balance in, in maintaining uh, both, both identities? Um, yeah, man, I think that's a great question because I still don't know the answer to that. I have no idea how the hell I found the balance to be too. <laughs> Somehow, some way, there's a higher power that has guided me to be able to complete both. But I can say it gets more and more challenging the more that you do it. And so there might be gaps uh, in between me putting out music and it has a lot to do with me trying to focus and be in character for something. And that's, I, think, I just think that's a phenomenal question, Gil, just because it's difficult, man. It's very difficult for me. I think everybody handles it different, but you know, as an artist, it's like you continue, and I'm sure Babyface can attest to this, you have to constantly reinvent yourself just as an artist alone. 
So you have to continue to try to push the envelope and do things that you've never done, especially when you're coming out with your own music because people don't want to hear the same thing over and over again. And then when you're picking specific movie roles, you kind of got to make sure you don't get typecast and do the same role over again. So you have to challenge yourself even more when you get the role that you want that's going to take you away from everything else that people thought you could do. So the more and further you go on, it's these two, these two tangents and they keep going further away from each other. And you start, you, you'll get at a point where you just, it's a fight, man, it's a, it's a fight. <laughs> Babyface, please, I want to hear what you got to say to this. <laughs> well, I, I think you're right, but I, you know, I think the best way to look at it, because, you know, if, I, if you're writing songs, if you're producing or if you're acting, um, um, the whole thing is like all of it is your artistry. So when you're not doing the music and you're acting, that's your artistry. And when you're doing the music, that's still your artistry. If you're just writing a song, that's your artistry. Everything is, when I'm hearing someone else performing a song that I've written, that's my artistry. Everything is all part of this thing that, that God gave us, this gift that God gave us. And so, you know, you don't have to feel um, spread out because all, it's all part of you. And at certain points, the thing that becomes great at a certain point, you get to a point to where yeah, a whole lot of things come in, and that's where you're put in a position to where you're able to pull in other people and pull in younger people that can help you and do, do other work, and, and then they start to build careers and, and, and build. So you're able to help others do the same thing that you're doing. Great that's point. Still, that's still your art. Once again, you're touching other people to touch other people. So um, the more that we work together and help each other, I mean, the first Honestly, the first time when I heard um, when I heard Whitney Houston performing on TV live and Ricky was the band and I heard that, I was like, who did that music? Who was that? Because that sounded better than the record. You know, the emotion, the things that, the, that was hidden. And I was like, he's a producer. That's like, that's really, that's, that's the real passion. And the one thing I always gave Whitney is, Whitney was the best TV performer ever. Every time that she hit that stage on TV, she'd knock it out the park. And it was always with the arrangements. And I always, I like, so that hit me like, well, who's that? So you start asking questions about who does what and who, do, who does this, because that's what you listen to to get inspired by. I mean, so now you're looking for not just Ricky Minor, but the new little Ricky Miners that are running around people that are able to do that too, because the, the truth is there's more than enough work for everybody to be able to do. We just got to make sure that, that everybody has the chance to be able to do that. And they believe that they can do it because for the most part, they don't, people don't, they don't look at you and think that you can handle it and that you can pull it off. And so that's why you give people chances to, to kind of, kind of prove it, you know, because I just have to say that when, when we, as a people, grab something and take something with our passion, amazing things happen and beautiful things happen. You know, there's something, something special about it. So um, uh, once again, if you look at it all as like, it's all my artistry, you don't have to worry about, you ain't put a record out. Chris, you ain't got to worry about when, when's the last time you put a record out? It doesn't matter so much because what you are, you're ludicrous. <laughs> and that goes everywhere at this particular point. So when you decide to do it, that's when you decide. And, and you know, the time will tell you when it's, when it's right and when it's not. And that's the good thing about it too, because as you're going through things, you, nah, that's kind of whack. I ain't gonna mess with that. <laughs> you you kind of get to learn, you know, yourself and get better at what you're even doing, you know, as long as you're paying attention and it looks like you've been paying attention. So um, that's all good things. Well, brother, I can definitely say that uh, the good thing is that I, I am inspired by you and it is a little easier as an artist once you have over about nine or 10 albums for you to take your time <laughs> and put out more music. But, so I appreciate you for being a driving force and an individual that motivated me to even get to the point where we're in the elite amount of individuals. I mean, obviously you're in a class all by yourself, but to be an artist that can say they have a, a certain amount of body of work 
is 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 a beautiful thing all by itself. But all I was saying is that if you have two or three albums and you out here taking your time, that's different than if you got nine <laughs> or ten albums and you out here taking your time. So thank you for being you and everything that you've done to contribute to the culture and raise individuals like myself from a mentality of it can be done and it is possible. And no matter what genre any of us are in, man, you're, you're a trailblazer and a pioneer. And I, I'm sure you've heard that many times, but it doesn't hurt coming from an individual like myself right now. Wow. I, I appreciate that. I just let me say one thing to you. Yeah. It's not the quantity, it's the quality of the album. That you That's true. That's true. That's, that's very true. Yeah. Very true. Look, you just shut up everything I just said. That's 100% correct. If you come out with an album like Kendrick Lamar and you're getting killer surprises, it don't matter if that's one album or none, but you yeah. are correct. Thank you, sir, for, for, uh, for correcting me on that. You're right. Yep. Ricky, you were going to say something? No, I, I, exactly what these guys said, but I want to add that you know, we are perfect in everything that we do. And the fact is, is I know what I know and then there's everything else. So I'm all right with that. I don't have to know everything. And, and like Kenny said earlier is that, you know, what I don't know, I'm not a, a, ashamed to call people in and bring in a team. I mean, working on, on shows like the Oscars and the Grammys and the Emmys and all these kind of event TV shows, Aretha Franklin specials and all this stuff is that uh, it's because of the team. And I think for me, the balance, you were asking earlier about the balance, for me, it's, it's uh, I got the Virgo brain. So I take like copious notes and I'm organized and I have a different team for each project going on at you know, five or six projects all at once, shows back to back. And it's about making a list and then going right to it. And every day getting up in gratitude, only attitude is gratitude wake up with that, you're good. And then you just move forward, bring your team together, talk about this, make your checklist, whatever doesn't get done today is going on the mall's list. And every day you just wake up with that gratitude because right now someone would, would give, give anything to be in a position to do one thing that either of you guys have done, you know, just one, just be in a room one time with anyone that you're in, to be on the set with Luda, to be in the studio. I mean, so, that gratitude is going to let you know that your best authentic self is not only good enough, it's excellent. I love that. It, it, I mean, you guys have been so inspiring to so many people. It's nice that you're inspiring to each other, but to millions of people. Like when you talk about the Waiting to Excel soundtrack, it's just like, thank God you, you worked up the, the courage because that <laughs> changed my life. It changed so many people's lives. Um, and same with Luda, same, same with you, Ricky. I want to know, out of all of these projects that you had a, a deeper hand in, aside from the album, with production specifically and, and, and with on the screen, what is one that for you really stands out and, and take us through um, just, I guess, the after effects of, of looking at what you did with that particular, be it uh, the Oscars, um, you know, putting that together or, or you know, a particular film that you worked on, um, Chris, or, or a particular soundtrack, any, like, what was the one that you kind of look back at and you say, I did that? Oh, for me, it's easy. It would definitely be crashed. So there's a whole story that goes along with that. And it was an independent movie and everyone was getting paid scale. I mean, if you look back at all of the A-list actors that were in it and I was just getting started and just even be a part of that ensemble was phenomenal. But, um, you know, I think we all had a good idea that it was going to shake up the world and cause a lot of great conversation just from preconceived notions of, of how people think about other races and it was way far ahead of its time. But in terms of, you know, once it got out there and started winning these awards, like the Critics' Choice Awards and, you know, the People's Choice Awards, and we were just, it was crazy. It was, it was just in crazy. Africa. And, yeah, it won in we Africa. It was our yeah. best movie of the year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So, so for me, it was great because I remember that year we won a couple awards and I remember Brokeback Mountain or something. It was winning all of the big awards for best picture that year. And then when we got to the Oscars, we felt that obviously Brokeback was going to win again. And if anybody looks up or Googles that moment 
and you look at the look on all of our faces when they say that Crash is the best picture, uh, Oscar winner, Academy Award for best picture, we were all completely surprised because we had no idea whatsoever. And that was a defining moment for me, not only for being in the movie, but just from the experience of going through that whole campaign trail and just, you know, all the award ceremonies and just being accepted as, as a true actor and, and what that movie has done to this day to, to create conversation and, and create change. So that's an easy one for me. What about you, Kenny? It's hard to say because I think there, there are just so many different moments of just throughout my my history where I'm always in disbelief. Like, really? This happened? I'm kind of like, you know, I got the Taylor Swift half the time. You know? it's like, <laughs> um, but because it's it's like each time that you finish something, first of all, you got to talk yourself into saying, I'm good enough, I can do this. Uh, which, uh, honestly, I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because it pushes you to um, to try to go harder. If something seems like it's difficult, rather than giving up, you you kind of just you push yourself and, and, and you don't run away from it. But you don't go into a cocky like you know I got this, and um, and that that all depends on the, the personality of, of each person. So for me, each time that something would happen. Um, it's like even though, like with Excel, even though you had the, um, you had every great singer there to work with, um, you didn't know what, I didn't know what I would do on them, whether it would, it would last, whether everybody would feel the same way. Working with uh, Forrest on the movie, that you didn't, you didn't know what it was going to really connect. And so... So you can be proud of an accomplishment that you can do, but I can be just as proud of doing this little small movie called Josie and the Pussycats where it was completely just, you know, um, like punk rock, you know, um, um, bubblegum rock almost to a certain extent that I, was, that I was able to work with a few artists that helped teach me how to do that as well. And so it was another thing that I could, I could take home with me. Because you do certain things, it opens other doors. From that, all of a sudden, I'm doing, I'm working with Fallout Boy, which would never, which you would have never seen that. So things that happen in your life that, that kind of, um, they that, that you accomplish, they take you to other places, and so there's not one particular thing because each thing that you do could take you to a whole other place that had nothing to do with whatever you were doing. So. It's not one particular project that I can say, that's the one, that's the one that made all the difference. I think it's a combination of everything that you do that ultimately, you know, opens up the doors for, for anything that you do. For sure. And how about you, Ricky? Yeah, I mean, I just want to echo that. I mean, so strongly uh, that everything leads to the next thing. And I, 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 when he was saying that, I thought about my... Uh, I, I grew up in the projects in Watts and, uh, and I sang in a little group trying to be like the Jackson Five and, uh, and I sang Jermaine Jackson's part. And, and uh, we had a little high school band that backed us up and, uh, and then they graduated because they wanted to play jazz and you know all hip and everything. So my uncle said, you guys got to learn the instrument. And I picked the bass. I mean, it was that me, I picked the bass because I wanted to keep my part no, because Jermaine had a couple of lines in there, you know what I'm saying? So I wanted yeah. to keep that, I wanted to keep playing, uh, singing in that part. But that started something. See, that got the ball rolling. So each thing just built on the other. And you couldn't have told the, 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 the little Ricky at, at 12 years old that he'd be conducting the Oscars one day. Mm -hmm. So all and all that and all the work in between. You can't, you can't tell me which the next thing to come that I would even meet Whitney Houston, let alone at, at that time when she was 18 and I was 22. So, I mean, all these things just build on the other, but it's important that you recognize your responsibility in it moving forward. You can get an opportunity, but you've got to make each one count. So you got to show up, show out. You guys, we're in Black Music Month. Sorry, Janine. 
Um, you know, it's a month about music that's very specific to our culture. Uh, what does it mean to each of you? I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let Babyface start off with that one. <laughs> what's, what's the question again, Nancy? Well, I mean, we're in Black his, Black Music Month. What does what does that mean to you? The, the, uh, it's a certified, you know, officially stamped, sanctioned, government st sanctioned month celebrating the legacy of uh, Black creators like the three of you. How do you feel about it? Um, to be honest, every month is Black History Month to me. Um, Thank you. Thanks. Pretty. And Black Music Month. Yeah, and and Black. It, it, it's because because it's 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 forever it, it's it just doesn't happen in one month that we finally you know we arrive uh, i think we are always here and it's and people are always whether it's our films or whether it's our music it's it's in everybody's hearts all the time so to a certain extent you know i appreciate it but at the same time i'm kind of like we're, we're always here and i'm always celebrating it Every time you <laughs> turn on the radio, you're celebrating it because you're listening to the influence in any and everything we do. Anything that's popular, we're usually behind it. Um, so I think that um, this is it's it's great to put to put a microscope on it, um, but it's also it's always here. So yeah, I would. Uh... I would I would add to that by saying he, it's, he's 100% correct and that it's always here. And if you trace the roots of music in this country back to the origin, uh, you know, whether we're talking about spirituals, whether we're talking about gospel, we're doing it to rock and roll, we're talking about jazz, that, you know, formed into hip hop, all these different things, they originated from one point. So... Black Music Month means nothing to me in this country. I feel like it's Black music every single day. It has been from the start. And that's how I'll leave it with that. I don't want to get too deep. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, look, out of, out of pain and suffering comes great lessons. And it, in the same way, that music represents deeper connection to our soul and our purpose for all of us. And, and I will say out of, out of the suffering, when you hear Aretha Franklin sing Hurts Like Hell, if you don't feel that, then check your heartbeat. Just check, have somebody take you to the hospital right now. <laughs> check it out. And I'm telling you every, I mean, and everything that Aretha's saying, because it's, it came from a deeper place. And I think that that's what everyone connects to black music, black culture, black storytelling, because this is, and, and it's not, it wasn't like by choice that the pain and suffering is felt and that the trauma is felt right this very moment throughout the world, because this trauma is real uh, and has been real. And we, we, and the only way that we're gonna move forward, any of us, is that everyone needs to own up to responsibility. Every single living being. Preach, and, and just to add to that real quick, it's funny you say that because I just started a platform and we released a video today that's it's by kids and for kids and it's a song called Get Along. So when you are off of this particular panel, I would love for you guys to go to kidnation.com and look at this song and video called Get Along. And Janine, you know, especially you and Gil, I, I just would appreciate it because I feel like you're going to get very emotional and it may be something you want to spread to even more people than are just on this panel right now. So. Thank you for that segue, Ricky, because you're 100% correct and it speaks towards everything that's going yeah. on right now, yeah. but it puts you in the innocent mindset of a child and how they feel. So Kid Nation, thank you guys. I'm on it. I love that. I, I actually had the, the talk with my five-year-old after the Sesame Street CNN town hall this weekend, so I'll be, I'll be tuning oh. into that. Wait till you see this. Wait, wait till you see this. Even more powerful. So, so to that point, I wanted to ask about uh, what is the role of the producer in this moment that we're in right now? Just shifting over, we've seen these protests sweeping the nation. 
um, the, the pain that is felt in the Black community is nothing new, but um, the reaction seems very different than anything that I've experienced in my lifetime. Um, just the overall community that seems to be forming around this particular case. Uh, but what would you say, What everyone has been kind of digging for, what is my role in this? What can I do? What would you say the role is for the producer at a moment like this? And, and, and what's the role for Hollywood? When you so say producer, you mean music producer? You talking about movie producer? What do you mean? Let's go with movies. Let's go with with uh, with Hollywood and, and 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 movie producers. But you can tie in the music as well. I mean, it, it all goes under the umbrella that art is supposed to imitate life right now. And there are some people that I just feel whether you're a producer behind the camera or whether you're a producer in music, you got a right to what you feel. And there's an extreme emotion and extreme feeling in all type of different emotions, frustration, anger, um, you know, and I think that that should lead with how you're going to produce whatever is going on at the moment. And I feel like there are a lot of people that are not able to come out with art at this moment because they, they don't really understand how to imitate art in the way in which life is presenting itself at this particular moment. Yeah. What about you, Kenny? This is, um, it's interesting for me because I think that what happens a lot in, in times like this and, and although we are at a unique time, we, uh, we haven't been here. Uh, but, you know, as an artist, there are so many people that are trying to put the We Are The World song together right now. And, and I don't know the people, and, and I don't know the people want to hear We Are The World right now, um, to be honest. I, I, I don't. It's, it's a different time and it's a different feeling. And people don't listen to music the same way. So they're not quite as kumbaya, if you know what I'm saying. They, they don't necessarily want to hear it. They want to see it. They want to feel it. And when you're seeing it and feeling it, you, you're seeing and feeling it when you're seeing all these people that are marching on the streets that would have never marched before. Now, I, 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 I do believe that part of it is COVID-19 has kind of like also helped this situation as well because nobody was working nobody got any jobs everybody so for, for once everybody is actually available to pay attention uh, they don't have other things in their life going on so now they can actually see oh wow that kind of sucks what i just saw where it also sucked what we just saw uh, two months earlier you know with Arbery. It's, it, it's been sucking for a while for little things. Maybe it's not tons and tons of it, but it's just enough to where we're now at this point where the world changed a little bit when they, when they finally saw on Memorial Day, they saw, you know, George Floyd get killed the way that he got killed. The world changed that day. And it changed because for once, people opened up their eyes and, and didn't close them. And they had to keep watching for, for almost nine minutes. And with that, it finally touched people that it wouldn't have touched before. And so when you look at the protest and you look at people walking, many times you'll see people walking, you won't see any, you, you'll see very few blacks there. It'll be as many white people out there, are pe people from all different um, ethnicities that are out there. So the world, definitely changed and it's changing and so what is our job as producers as writers we certainly should look but we shouldn't just jump out and start saying things we have to we have to watch closely and see where it goes you can't just you can't just come out with the kumbaya song or come back out with a mad song right now because we gotta you gotta really kind of see um what's happening you certainly need to be there to say okay, what's the next step? How do we change this? How do we make it happen? You know, how do we get people out there to register to vote and not just vote, but also uh, start reading to know, un understand what you're voting for and who you're voting for and, and what, what's the purpose of it? Where are we going? What do we want? The real question is, what do we want? Not just give me money or not just, not just give me this, but just what do you want in the neighborhood world? So, you don't just go out and throw out emotions and, and write that song because I feel like that 
I, I feel like that's not necessarily what's going on here. When Stevie Wonder used to write the songs that he wrote, he was writing them because that, that was real things that were going on in his heart. And he was writing it and we felt it that way. He wasn't writing it because, oh, this would be cool, you know, to do, do me a, a song, that, you know, a protest song. I'm going to write me a protest song. He wrote songs that was that were going on in his heart. And to this day, he still even talks like that and feels like that because that's that's the natural thing. So out of this, what do I want? Out of this experience and everything that's going on, it's not in the old stuff. It's the new artists that have become. It's the young people have to march and saying things better than we're saying them, feeling things better than we're feeling them. And that's where it's going to come from is younger people are finally going to start saying things in a way that we don't quite know how to say it in the coolest way or the way they will connect, but they will. And, and so anything I can do to help those artists that can figure out how to say what you want to say, then I think that's what my job is. My job is necessary to be the leader voice and, and, and saying the things about from my perspective because it's not going to be my world much longer. <laughs> it's going to be there. So... I'm just, uh, I just got a ticket for a little while, a little while, a little bit longer, and I'll be here to help them take it over. Facilitate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For a lot longer, Kim. <laughs> what about you? <laughs> no, I mean, look, I, 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 can't, I can't even build on what was said because what was said is the truth. And, and I think that that's where we have to rely on uh, when we talk to uh, the elders, so we understand where we came from and those who are alive. If you have uh, 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 people, uh, elders in your life, talk to them about life, you know, not about what was or what could be or what should have been, but just let them talk and listen. You need to do a little more listening, le a little less talking right now, listen. You know, collaboration is such a big part of what you do as you each have spoken to, particularly in TV and film. And we have Judith McCrary, who I know has uh, collaborated with each yeah. of us. <laughs> <laughs> What's up? Hi, Judith. Hi. I know that you and Kenny are working on a, a very popular BET show now. Talk about that working relationship. Well, I mean, it, it was really interesting because I hadn't been in a, uh, on a music-driven TV show for quite some time. Like, the first... TV show uh, job that I had was New York Undercover. And that was completely different. It was a lot of clearing of music, which was incredibly complicated, but you know, it's a, it's a whole different process now, but we were doing uh, uh, remastering songs for actors who were playing real people who had performed on the show and also doing needle drops for the show. And it was excruciating. Like I had no idea that an artist could say, yes, I'll clear my song for the show, but their publisher said no. And so it just took me down a rabbit hole that I thought I'd never get out of, but eventually we got it done. Um, and Kenny was very helpful. But he was also, you know, it's like interesting when musicians speak in music and you don't know what they're saying. Like I wanted a song done and both Kenny and his engineer said to me, that's a lot of chords. And they kept saying it like I should understand what they meant. And he finally explained to me. She can't play the piano and sing at the same time. <laughs> it's too many chords. But if you don't speak music, you're just like, ah, okay. So, right, Kenny? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that moment. <laughs> you know, and then, of course, you've also worked with Chris. Uh, yes. What was that like? Uh-oh. Oh. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait, why are, you, why are you putting on a spot like that, man? We don't know what's going to come out right now. <laughs> Actually, it was, pretty fa it was pretty fantastic because what happened was Dick Wolf just said, 
go for it. So what I did was I split, he was in two episodes and they were split by exactly one year apart, which showed the true process of someone um, arrested for murder. It takes them exactly a year to bring the case to trial. So that was pretty great. Even though he was, oh my God, the demands, he wanted his m and m separated. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was coming. Hey, you know what's crazy though? Not to cut um, Judith off, but at a, even I, I, I named Crash earlier about being, you know, um, a monumental moment for me. But if anyone were to ever ask me what my favorite role that I played was, it's definitely this Law and Order out of everything I've done. And that's television, completely separate from any movie I've done. I feel like that was the, the most challenging and the best role that I've played is, is playing that Darius character on Law & Order. And I love that role more than anything. So thank you, Judith, for being there for me and helping me through that. I mean, I had a headache after I played that role because that's how much I was in, you know, that character of what he was going through. And until this day, they keep re-airing this episode that we did like 14 years ago. And I'm like, wow. Never in a minute. I didn't realize that, that was going to happen. So I'm very thankful for Law and Order. Well, and just speaking to that, um, the one thing that I think going back to a previous question about what Hollywood should do to meet this moment, and I can't believe that I actually have to say this and that we actually have to do it, is to just do the smaller stories that show that people are actually human. We got to go back to the fundamentals in just declaring that for people who, whole groups of people who are alive and breathing and yet they're not seen as human. To actually have to walk around today with signs from the 60s going, I am a man or even I am a woman because, and the, I think that what happened to George Floyd was that cop decided that he wasn't a human being. He made that determination and there are a whole lot of people that look at other groups of people and say they don't matter because they're not human. And I think our stories have to go back to the fundamentals, the foundation of that, which is blowing my mind that we actually have to be convinced that other people actually have a right to live. But that's what we got to do, period. Well, I wanted to take that and say, like, you guys have projects that you've been brought on to or, you know, as, as Chris said, he's, you know, you've been called into the audition, but what about your babies? What is something that you are either working on right now or, or, or just wrapped that was something that you either ideated or got behind and were kind of in more of a spearhead situation? Be it, you know, a, a movie you're working on, or I know that Chris has had some things in the works recently, um, a show, like how has it been bringing your own babies, your own ideas to the forefront, and what are those right now? Is that to me? That, that's to all of you. So we, we can start with Judith. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's just that the, the business is sort of shut down right, right now. Some people are taking Zoom pitches, but they're very hard. It's really difficult. Can you imagine trying to pitch a project like this? to a group of executives, it kind of doesn't work. So it's just a matter of writing on spec your own stuff so that by the time this shutdown is over, you have something for them to read. Um, and, uh, and I feel like I have to reboot now. Hmm. Everything, what was important to me three months ago isn't important today. I feel like I have to start over, to be honest. 
Guys, how are you? I mean, Ricky, how are you going to transition back in? Well, that's the thing. You know, before all this started, I had about about seven or eight projects that I was developing and everything and had meetings set up the week before the shutdown. And so pitch meetings. So I'm looking at every single one and same thing, the same, same thing too. Is, is this important to me? Is this relevant? What is the story that I want to tell? And like Kenny said, based on the time I have left, <laughs> uh, what is the story? <laughs> and what, where do I want to spend my time? And, and how do I want to leave this place better, uh, you know, and, and better than it was in, in my little small world? How can I, because that's where it starts from inside out. It's never outside in, it never was, and it never will be. It's inside out. So I have to reevaluate inside and take a look at these things. And there's a couple of them that I'm starting to look at that push to the side. It may not be, be what I what the story that I want to hear or that I want to tell. Yeah. What about you, Kenny? Um it's been kind of funny for me because it's been a weird time because it's like um, you know, I actually um at the top of March, I actually had caught, you know, the um the virus, I was down for about 17 days with this virus and um, self-quarantine. And so that gave you a whole lot of time to self-reflection <laughs> uh, and, you know, points where you were scared, not knowing whether it's this going to be, this going to get really bad um, and uh, just not, just not knowing. And then um, coming out of it, which was the weirdest thing, all of a sudden this, little idea comes up from Swiss Beat and Timberland about doing this whole battle thing. And, uh, and I find myself in the middle of a battle with Teddy Riley. And uh, <laughs> which was, we like to call musical, <laughs> which we call musical celebration. And um, so what, what happened from that was that um, it seemed like the world had, world had already stopped. And it felt like the world wanted to come and, and dance and be in love and listen to music that made them feel good. And everybody that was trying to get on there, they couldn't get on. Everybody was coming on there to, not for the battle, but just for the music. And it was from all age groups. Um, and so suddenly there was, um, Suddenly there were new fans that I picked up and new people that were interested because they, they heard music that they hadn't heard before or hadn't heard in a long time. Their parents listened to it and said, oh, wow, maybe they weren't so wrong after all. It, 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 it does feel good. Um, and so for me, things have been kind of busier um, because of that. And other doors have opened because of that. And so it's kind of giving me a voice to where I, I, I'm very careful about what I say and how I say uh, things because um, it's um, this time that we, that we have, um, you know, once again, the world has changed. Otherwise, I can look at, I had so many dates that I had canceled, all the things because I'm out still performing live and those dates, I'm sure that's not going to happen until 2021 at this particular point. Um, and, and I have to be concerned about the guys that I work with, the musicians that I work with. What happens with them? They don't, they don't get to go out and, you know, they don't have the same opportunities that I have. You know? and, and so it affects so many things in terms of what has happened with us all. So, to, and even in uh, doing film, doing TV, everybody can't go right back to work because we still have to concern ourselves with social distancing. We ain't out of this yet. You know, it feels like it, but we don't know. So it's hard to know exactly still at this point where any of us are going. We just got to kind of uh, be positive and hope that it all and pray that it, keep, it works out and keeps going. But I think in the, in the process of it, um, the only thing we can do is, is, is pray and, and be positive and uh, that that it, that it does work out. And that's kind of like where, where I go. I like, you know, um, I just kind of approach everything like this is going, this is going to turn out okay. And, and stay positive. Um, because that's the only thing I know how to do is, is stay positive and I always believe that it's going to work out. 
You know, I know we wish this could last forever, but unfortunately, our time is up today. But um, on behalf of the African American Film Critics Association and PGA, again, we'd like to really, really thank you for giving us your time, sharing your wisdom and your knowledge. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank all of you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thanks you. for having me. Thank you, guys. Can we okay. answer maybe a few questions from the QA? Maybe at least one. Do we have time for that? Um, we can probably ask, answer like two of them. I think they can even type in the answers. Okay. Uh, Janine, do you want to take one or do you want me to start? Sure, sure. Uh, this one is coming from Malcolm Farrell and it's for Ludacris. Uh, what are some key things you have learned that help the acting fundamentals? Key things that have my learning acting fundamentals. I, I could say that I worked with Terrence Howard twice and uh, he, he taught me some things early on where it's like, you know, when you come into doing a movie and you get direction, um, you know, from the director and he's and you doing a take and they're constantly kind of telling you how they want you to do it. Terrence was always telling me, you know, you can take that into account. You can listen to what the director is saying, but always do deep down exactly what it is you want to do. Otherwise, they wouldn't have chose you as a particular individual for this role. And so that always stuck with me, you know what I mean? Because a lot of times you just want to please everybody. You want to come in and do the best you can. And if somebody's telling you to make sure you do it this way, that's the, that's what the beauty of doing different takes is. And then they get to choose from the best one or which one is the most organic. So I think that's one of the best things that, that stuck with me in terms of what I was, what I was told. And, and, and Steve Temple is, is getting to it. He says, uh, with the financial and creative success you each have earned, what type of financial advice do you share with the new emerging talent that seeks your personal advice? So let's take it from the Kenny. Financial, uh, exactly what is it? What's yeah, he's that? saying, what type of financial advice do you have you shared with new emerging talent that seek you out personally because of your success? Um, I think, you know, um, Ricky said it earlier, you know, it's like it's having a good team around you because you can't know everything and you can't, you can't control everything and you can't run everything. And those people that usually try to do, they, it, they, it ends up being, you know, not working out so great because you're trying to do something that you, you're not an expert at. So it's really uh, kind of trying to um, surround yourself with a good team, uh, usually not your best friend. Um, <laughs> I was just going to say the same. Don't you, don't don't you, don't don't your you cousin, cousin Mike. Yeah, no cousin, <laughs> no cousin Ray Ray's. M mechanic. Uh, Mike the mechanic. <laughs> exactly. Because uh, now if, they, if they've gone to school and do that, and, and then maybe, you know, at that particular point, but many times family and business do not mix. Um, and uh, it's better to, you know, to surround yourself with people that, that also have done, done it before. So they can protect you, make the best deal for you, and that you can uh, um, always be straight. Sure. And, and, and this one for Ricky from an anonymous attendee. Um, how has white privilege affected your stride through the TV and film industry? Do you think it was easier or harder for you because of your footing in the music industry? So have, have you personally been affected by white privilege? Uh, if I have, I didn't know about it. Uh, you know, I, if I didn't get a job because of a white privilege, someone thought that I, I don't know about it. So I think, I mean, for me, I'm just driving this train. I'm driving the Ricky train through and, and either you're going my way or you're in my way, but I'm going this way, <laughs> straight ahead. Yeah. So I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, like I said, I wouldn't know if it did because I'm too busy working. Got it. Got it. And then from Tobin D. Costin, this is for everyone, um, but let's start with Judith. Um, as leaders in the entertainment industry, do you feel you have a responsibility to have an impact on society as a whole? So do you feel that responsibility in the work that you just do in your daily life? I, I don't necessarily think about it in those terms. I just start trying to tell the story I want to tell if it's impactful and if I've done what I was supposed to do and it says something weighty um 
that's great. But if I approach a story with the weight of that, the story will never stop. It just won't. What, what about you, Chris? Like there's, there's always that. I'm, I'm not a role model, I'm just me. But do you feel that responsibility? No, I, I do. I do feel that responsibility. Um, I think with great power comes great responsibility. You know, we don't always want it, but we have to assume the role that we have it at a certain point. And um, I didn't really get to answer the last question. So I'm going to combine these two together in terms of what I'm doing with that responsibility. I feel like some of the art that I'm doing has to showcase that responsibility. And one well, of the things I have on right now about foster care. Yeah, so there's a movie I have coming out and it's an independent movie and it's, I'm just gonna give the premise and then let everyone realize how this art is gonna spark a lot of you know conversation. And it's about an interracial couple that adopts a teenager that's part of the Aryan Brotherhood. So in terms of all the things and the conversation and things that are going on in the world of today, this is how I try to use my art to to make change and, and I can't tell you the whole story but that's the premise of it and that should be interesting enough and also with the Kid Nation thing that I was telling you guys about earlier which I know you're going to check out once we get off of here that's definitely uh, creating a positive lane for the future. You know this was real sweet but I know that uh, Kenny has to go to a PGA mentoring session. Uh, again we thank you and um, you know till next year. Yeah. Hopefully we'll be able to do this in person though. Yeah. 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 Kenny, I worked with everybody else on here, so we gotta work together sometime, man. <laughs> Look forward to it. Don't you oh, threaten gosh. him. <laughs> I mean the three of okay. you collaborating would be the four of you collaborating would be amazing. Yeah. All right. I'll write about it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we'll All review right. it. Thank you. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you guys. Very well. Thanks, everyone.